coming up on Influencing Entrepreneurs. For us, it's all about building those relationships between consumers and brands so that they stay loyal. And if I have a loyal relationship with a brand, I'm a customer forever and that drives revenue, which makes the client happy. So the fact that we had a hard time gathering was a big challenge for us. And so we had to get really creative. After years of teaching entrepreneurship and consulting with multiple companies, I realized that when business leaders share stories of not only their successes, but their mistakes, it had a huge impact in the classroom. So I thought, why not document those stories? On this episode of Influencing Entrepreneurs, we'll hear from Kristen Labonte, the president of Breaking Limits, a strategic consulting, communications, and marketing agency. I'm Casmer Ward, and this is Influencing Entrepreneurs. We're going to talk about a bunch of different things. Uh, one of the things I find that you know a lot of entrepreneurs don't just do one thing. So you're involved with both Breaking Limits and the Bobby Labonte Foundation. So as we talk about how you're involved in uh, two separate organizations, what is your background? What what where what led you to entrepreneurship? Well, I'll tell you, there's more than two. Okay, well, of course, there's got to be. Yeah, and. Um... What led me to this is, you know, the kind of the common thread between everything I do for everything I'm involved with is about um, creative thinking, creative problem solving, you know, thinking without paradigms, those kind of processes. So it doesn't matter if I'm working on something for the foundation or for my husband's career or for breaking limits, it's always trying to get the path laid out to where we want to go. Now, were you always like this? Did you start this way in elementary school, or is it something that clicked in college? So I have to give my parents a lot of credit. They were both very creative, and I'm an only child. I grew up on a farm where we pretty closely sustained ourselves. So we were organic before that was a thing. We had you know, our own animals to feed us, and gardens, and canned vegetables. And my mom uh, was an educator, and she was on the forefront of the gifted education wave at the time. And I used to joke with her, and I still do to this day, that she would experiment on me. <laughs> so all these creative problem-solving tasks that she was asking her students to do in class came through me first when I was seven. So, so give me an example, one that sticks out that you, maybe you even thought, mom's crazy, but now you, you, you put two and two together. Saturday morning is the one that sticks out in my mind. Saturday mornings, we clean the house. Now, again, it's my mom and dad and I, just the three of us. We had a small house. It was a farmhouse that we heated with a wood stove. So it gets quite dusty because you're heating with wood. Again, I'm seven, right? So she would turn on the music. My, mom, my parents were young parents, so they were in their 20s. I was seven, and they'd turn on the music, and we would find a better way, the most efficient way to do the house cleaning and have fun with it instead of looking at it as a chore. And I really think that kind of pushing me as a kid to whether it was the dishes or, you know, gardening, like I can remember hours picking green beans in the garden and then snapping them on the front porch. It was about efficiency and creativity and finding the best way for that process as a, as a kid. And so that really stuck with me all the way, yeah, until today. And then uh, my first job out of college was... Well, let's talk about that real quick. Let's yeah. talk about, um, so it's hard to leave home. You know, it's, you, you know, it, when we're teenagers, we want to leave home, but we don't want to leave home. But what, what led you to leave the farm life to, to go pursue your college degree? So from as far back as I can remember, both of my parents really encouraged me to pursue anything. They told me that I could be anything I wanted to believe, or that I could be anything I wanted to be. And I think because I didn't have a lot of outside influences like brothers and sisters that were giving me a hard time along the way, I believed them, and I still do today. And so, yes, we grew up on a farm. We did everything kind of our own way, which to me felt very normal. When I would go spend time with friends, it felt weird, but <laughs> to me at my house, that was the way that we lived. And so we had this farm life where we were kind of sustaining ourselves there and you know, making life happen. Um, I was also very competitive from a young age. 
I was showing horses um, on a national level, and I won three national championships at 12. And would that be with Fatsy? With Fatsy. Yes, yes, I remember reading about that, and I was like, what a great horse name. She was awesome. She, was, she loved to compete as much as I did. So when the bigger the show, the more she would perform, and I just kind of went with it. Like, I have to give her a lot of the credit for the wins because she was, she was as competitive as I was. We were a really, really good team. And uh, so as I, I got kind of into the middle school years, um, I discovered other sports, as often happens in middle school, and I discovered that I had some swimming abilities. So as I kind of aged out of the age group that I was showing horses in, I kind of naturally fell into swimming and very quickly rose to the junior national level and swam all the way through high school. I still have high school swimming records and in Indiana and I went to college on a swimming scholarship. So I guess what kind of led me to, to leave the farm life was really about just that pursuit. And I don't know if one of my parents, both my parents were competitive, but I would say they would agree that I'm the most competitive of the three of us. But I still just believe to this day that I, if I put my mind to something that I can do it. So, so in your teenage years, you, you, you're, you believe you can do whatever you want. You know, you believe in yourself. What did you want to do? Well, you know, for me, it was about success and success was defined, you know, different ways. And I've kind of evolved from one thing to the next thing to the next thing well, in my entire career. what did it look at, like, that senior year of high school? Yeah, I'm... it was a full ride. I wanted yeah. a full ride. And right. uh, I ended up with a great scholarship to Southern Illinois University. Um, at the time when I was going there, they were a swimming powerhouse and I was one of their top recruits. And, you know, for me, it was, I was in this position where I was very, very good, but I wasn't the best. And so I had to decide, do I want to be the superstar at a really good school? or do I want to be middle of the road at an amazing school, as far as swimming goes. Right. Um, and so I, I felt more comfortable because I'm so competitive and so much driven to have that accomplishment that I chose the really good school where I was the big fish. So you, now you work in marketing and strategy and, and really everything related to business. When does that start taking shape for you? It, I would, so I studied graphic design in college. And really, I know going into college is so tough to decide what you want to do. And so I, that was sort of my default because I had this big creative background and my mom was a painter and my dad had some experience in architecture. And, you know, so we were often thinking in two and three dimensional design and creativity and things like that. So falling into a design major kind of made sense to me logically you know I didn't like I didn't feel like I was ever going to be an accountant or you know I wasn't going to be a psychologist those just weren't my things um, and to be honest with you I'm I doubted whether graphic design was going to be my thing um, but when I graduated you know like most college seniors you face in the real world right right so you've got to figure it out and I felt that pressure and essentially um, interviewed everywhere I could with uh, graphic design up in you know into the Chicago and Indianapolis I went to school in Illinois so you know in that area St. Louis trying to find the great entry-level job with a really fantastic agency and what I learned was my timing was terrible my timing could not have been worse so I was essentially one of the last graphic design classes to go through without computer skills so I walk into these agencies and they're four years ahead of me. Like they're doing everything on computers at that time. And I had no computer skills. So me being the problem solver, I uh, convinced my parents that since my scholarship had paid for my apartment for the summer, I should stay there and not move home and find a job and pay for my bills. And so they agreed if I could pay for myself, I could stay. So I started working in a Western store because I knew, you know, boots from my childhood days. I knew a lot about boots and Western clothes. And we listened to the country radio station in town while we were there. And the country station was advertising for an account executive. So I had no idea what an account executive was, but it was at the country radio station. And that sounded... It sounds like a great... It sounds industry. amazing, right? Yeah. At, I was 21, 22 years old to work at a radio station around musicians and music that I love sounded fantastic. 
So I interviewed for the position. They, uh, I specifically remember one thing I told them that if they would spend a little time with me and they could you know, teach me what I needed to know that I could learn and I would do it, I would be great. And they hired me the next day. So let's talk about the transition real quick. Uh, being a swimming superstar, uh, you know, succeeding well in that, that area in both high school and college. Now you're out in the real world and you find out you're, you're four years behind. How, how do you deal with that? I mean, it, you found success with, or I'm assuming, we know you found success, but we know you, you move on to the uh, country radio station. But what is that transition like? What does that do to you, to your ego? What does it do to where you're trying to find your place in life at that moment? Well, I, for me, it just goes back to that belief. Like I just believed that I could make a path there at the radio station. And of course, being competitive, you know, the radio station job became my new sport. So I wanted to be the best at that, that I could be. And coming from an athletic background, I think something that has served me well is that as an athlete, you are trained to deal with adversity and welcome stress. You don't shy away from that. Like as an athlete, you're putting your body under tremendous stress and you've got to feel comfortable in that stress and not lose focus. And so for me, that did not feel like an adverse situation. It was new and it was exciting, it was different, and I went for it. And like, in a matter of time, I, you know, I was the top salesperson. I'd sold more radio ads than anybody. You know, I, that, that is just the way that I approached it, that this is what I'm gonna do now and it's, it's gonna be great and I'm gonna give it my all. And it was great. So you, you find that success there. When do you want more than the success within those boundaries? and decide you're gonna start running a company? So what, what worked out really well, I did not actually run a company for another 15, 16 years. But what, what happened is I went through this evolution of experiences that I think prepared me for that. And um, at that radio station, that, that one move is marquee uh, over all of the other jobs that I've had between college and being an entrepreneur. And that what happened in that job is that a lot of radio station salespeople sell based on ratings. So their job is to sell advertising. They go into the lawnmower sales per, uh, shop, right? The guy that sells lawnmowers on the corner, he's, you want him to buy ads on your country radio station. And most radio salespeople will walk in and say, we're number one. You gotta buy our station. We're the number one ranked station. Well, our market was so small, we were market 201, we didn't have any ratings. They didn't rate our market. So what I had to learn at that station is how to understand the person that I was talking to, put myself in their shoes, and figure out what it would be like to get a customer to walk through the door, right? So if, if they want me, the customer, to walk in and buy a lawnmower from them, what's it gonna take? And so, you know, taking all this creative thinking background that I had, and then applying it to putting myself in someone else's shoes and determining, you know, being able to determine what's going to drive me to do what they need me to do to be successful was the process that I learned then and I use it today with everybody I work with. So it's really building on that competitive edge that you, you already have. But I, at this point, you're using your creative problem solving and probably some degree of what you learned just as a graphic designer on the creative side yep. to figure out how to paint that picture so yeah, to say exactly and, and you, you build a career through that uh, the uh, you know where you're at right now is with breaking limits right bobby levante foundation you said there was uh, several other companies yes as well what type of companies are those so all of our all of our companies are kind of centered around my husband so bobby himself is a company right. he's got a career he needs a strategy successful nascar driver right Yep. So, at, and he, so he retired from full-time racing in 2016, but he's not retired by any means. And so it is weird to say this because he's my husband and obviously I love him very much, but we have to look at him as a product, as a brand, right? right? So his, his, he is the kind of the centerpiece of everything that we do. He's the you know, face of all of the companies and all the work, whether it's a, a partnership for him directly or something related to a race car 
or you know he is uh, has a television career so viewing him as a brand is kind of project one and then everything else that kind of centers he's the center everything else is kind of surrounding him has to also support the strategy that goes with who he is. So you would say that, that he is that brand and these companies kind of just feed the different operations Correct. for him. Correct. What is the first one that you get involved in that you're like, I can make a huge difference here and this It is... all happened at the same time. And what is that same time? Yeah, so that was, uh, we have been married uh, almost five years. And so you cannot, in my, in my opinion, it's almost like line extensions the way that, that our companies work. So Bobby's the Procter and Gamble, right? And then Breaking Limits and the foundation and his racing and all these are our line extensions, whether they're, you know, view them however you want, but they are an extension of him. And so for me, strategically, we cannot approach any one of these companies in a vacuum, right? They all have to be strategically aligned and working together consistently and in parallel and not contradicting each other in any way. I mean, and there's some simple things like, you know, his, his brand colors are red and black. So we use red and black in everything. Everything has its own logo. Everything has its own personality, but strategically everything aligns. And that's a simple example, but it, for me, everything has to be well orchestrated across the platform. Now, uh, if you don't mind me asking, did you guys start working together before you were involved in a relationship, after? It all happened at the same time. All happened at the same time. And what, what does that look like? What is the, the, the moment the spark hits? <laughs> well, so we, I got to give you a little more background to, to, for this story to make sense. Okay. After I uh, finished with my swimming career, got into my business career, I got quickly drawn back into athletics. Um, I was an all-American triathlete, and then at about 30 years old, I transitioned into professional cycling. And I raced bicycles professionally until I was 42. So that drive and determination and the competitive spirit obviously never went away. And athletics just feels comfortable to me. So as I was retiring from, from bike racing, his career was also kind of winding down. I got into running a professional cycling team and the team happened to be racing in North Carolina. And uh, a coach of mine was a friend of Bobby's and connected us. And so we met at a bike race. And from that first moment that we were together, we realized that most of the time when we're around other people, it's hard for us to feel comfortable because people are intimidated by us as athletes. Most of that's like his most of his experiences around people who see him as a race car driver. And it was the same for me that most people saw me at that time as a as a bike racer. And um, so for us, we weren't intimidated by each other. So that was a good start. But we also quick, very quickly transi transitioned into kind of the what's next with career conversation and how do you keep going and how do you stay relevant and you know coming off of an athletic career what else can you do and all of that so like you know the first weekend that that we that I was at that bike race and and I met Bobby for the first time he um, he sat and talked to me for hours and we you know we talked about exactly that like what do you do next and how do you figure it out and, and how do you make that transition and how do you take what we've learned as athletes and apply it to a business career that was that was probably monumental for us because we've both you know his obviously in a very grand stage very public national television intimidating I bet not Ironically, we were good. We weren't intimidated by each other, right. but, but coming but, off but of everything that, around it's got to be intimidating just not with Bobby himself, but with, you know, the the global perception. Yeah. 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 And I would say for both of us, you know, we we are still very competitive. He's still racing. Um, I consider my business career my sport now, so to me I'm still very competitive with other agencies that we compete with, but for both of us it's like we also feel we never let go of that pressure to be successful, whether we put it on ourselves or it's actually truly coming from outside, it always feels like it's there. 
Does family game night get extremely <laughs> competitive? I, I imagine with two competitive spirits, is that, I'll be honest, my first question is like, I wonder what race they could both go in and at least be neck to neck, to neck at, you know? I'm sure you know you could uh, beat him easily in cycling and hit him with driving, but is there something that you find together that you find yourself competing? Oh, them? all the time. <laughs> all the time. It's funny, We a couple years ago we had a, a, our family is awesome, first of all. I'll just say his family, my family, they just all merge together in one big happy family. So that's fantastic. Um, we do a lot of birthdays together for the little kids and then also for the adults because that's fun too. And we're not too old for that. We're all about it. So for Bobby, we had a bowling party a couple years ago. We got t-shirts made for everybody, all the little kids came, we had, you know, decorations, the whole deal. Of course, Bobby crushes everybody in bowling. I mean, he's a fantastic bowler, so. <laughs> it's like, how do you get away from competing and, you know, we need to do something that's, you know, not competitive. It's, it's hard. But it, again, that's our comfort zone. It's fun for us. And, and if we are on bikes, he'll race me. He'll like, you know, race me up a hill and of course I go, all out to beat him and and he pushes me too now so which is a great partnership yeah uh one of the things i would like to talk about you know we're talking a lot about business and the competitive edge but I, i'd like to talk about the bobby levante foundation sure because uh it, it there's a big part of entrepreneurship that you know it is to make money but at the same time when there's a great cause behind that uh t tell me a little bit about the bobby levante foundation sure so bobby founded the uh foundation oh, now it's probably 12 years ago and you know one thing that uh, I love about his approach is that he is so humble you know he's got these unbelievable accomplishments but he's the most down-to-earth humble nice guy you would ever meet and so he founded the foundation because he felt like he'd been giving all these opportunities to be successful and all these people over the years had opened doors for him that had contributed to that and he wanted to give back. And so the foundation has always been about providing opportunities for children and sometimes supporting their families to help make those opportunities happen. And so that's what we do still today is that we do uh, primarily one fundraiser week a year and we raise as much money as we can and then we award it back to organizations in our area that support building stronger futures for children and families. And sometimes we're supporting things like, you know, food insecurity, sometimes it's education and reading, sometimes it's mentorship, sometimes it is providing opportunities that the kids otherwise wouldn't have or experiences. And that, the, the, the examples can be endless, but at the end of the day, you know, going back to how I grew up and having, you know, this childhood of no, no, no paradigm, you know, Cleaning the house is not done any one way. Find the best way. Going back to that kind of thinking and then couple that with, with Bobby's generosity and how humble and giving he is, is, it just made sense for us to really give that our all. So going through COVID and the, the, the pandemic, which we're kind of hopefully on the tail end of, what kind of impact does that have on the foundation, if any impact at all? And also relating to the brand itself, does that take a hit during during the pandemic and how can they creatively solve each other's problems or, or work together? Yeah, so it was a tough year for the foundation. Um, we were able to continue our work because of a few really amazing donors to the foundation, um, but we had to take a step back for sure and say, okay, where's the need? What is it? Like it, it you know, it, in the past, we have awarded grants for very specific, but more big picture, future looking projects, right? This past year, we had to look in the here and now and see exactly what, what is happening, where's the need, and how can we help today? Not how can we help over the course of the year, but how can we help today? So we ended up doing a, a couple of small things over the course of the year instead of one big thing to continue the mission. So that's on the foundation side. How about on the branding side? Is, is it just, is it that at this point, it's just a machine that it keeps running or are there things that like need to be changed because of the current economic? For the foundation? Uh, no, outside for the brand for- For Bobby? For, for Bobby. And all of the companies? Yeah. Um, 
So I will say that what impacted the overall umbrella of companies and brands that we have um, is the, the fact that we couldn't be together, that people could not be together. That was the biggest monkey wrench for us, for sure, because a lot, almost all of our work involves people gathering, whether it's at racetracks or bicycle races or social events, or it, it's just all about people getting together and building those connections. And for Breaking Limits, our, our mission there is to help build stronger relationships between consumers and brands, okay? So you, I, we're a marketing company, and I almost hate to say we're a marketing company because I feel like that sells Breaking Limits so short. We go so much deeper than that. We go all the way back to what I was talking about with my first job out of college, where we really truly put ourselves in the shoes of the consumer and try to figure out what it's gonna to take to make me loyal to XYZ brand. It's very strategic based. Very, yeah. very. And so yes, we're a marketing company. Yes, we pr produce events, but it, that's not where it ends. That's where it starts. For us, it's all about building those relationships between consumers and brands so that they stay loyal. And if I have a loyal relationship with a brand, I'm a customer forever and that drives revenue, which makes the client happy. So the fact that we had a hard time gathering was a big challenge for us. And so we had to get really creative. Um, we got into COVID testing. We developed a partnership with a lab and brought them with us to quite a few private events last year um, and did on-site COVID testing and would rapid test everyone that came in. Now it's not perfect, uh, but it made people feel comfortable. Of course, all the protocols, the masks and the hand sanitizer and all of that was in place as well, but we had never had to think about how do we execute an event? How do we hold this together in some way when we're not really supposed to be together? So that was tough. I really want to talk about you. Your competitive story, I honestly, I'd, I'd like to do an ESPN <laughs> story about all the different sports you, you've tra uh, transversed over the years. But really, whether it's in sports or your professional career, we all have that one big loss that it hurts. Like, you still sit back and cringe. Do, do you have, do you already, have you already picturing it in your mind? Um... So when I took over Breaking Limits, there's been a couple. One's recent, um, which is still stings, and one is kind of what really drove me to take over Breaking Limits. So, um, you know, again, when, when Bobby and I got married, Breaking Limits was already in existence. It was, I did not found the company, um, but it was not, from the outside, to me, it didn't feel like it was operating as efficiently as it, as it could. And it, it, there were a lot of issues that I saw walking in that concerned me. However, there were legacy relationships there that Bobby had had for years with people who were extremely loyal to him and that meant a lot to him. And so kind of what really drove me to say, okay, I, I have to commit here, um, was we lost the biggest client that we had at that time. And the, there were a lot of issues and a lot of challenges And are you involved that. at this point, or are you just kind so of watching I was, from the outside? I was watching from the outside. Uh, I was running the pro cycling team at that time mm -hmm. and kind of tiptoeing in, mm -hmm. like popping in and offering my insight or my input, which in hindsight was a mistake because the people that worked there, like I said, some of them had been there for a long time and they didn't know whether they should listen to me or not. And then here comes the new wife, like telling everybody There's what to do. the perception that I'm sure is yeah. weighing on everybody's shoulders. Yeah, they're yourself. like, do we want to be nice to Kristen, but is she our boss or isn't she your boss? Right. So I did not help the situation at the time. Yeah. I should have either said, I'm in or I'm out. Right. Kind of can't be a little bit, right. right? So that was a mistake on my part. And I wish, in hindsight, I had jumped right in Right. And I don't know that I would have done everything right, but at least I would have been committed and they would have known I was committed. So we ended up losing that client and I regret that I did not commit and get involved from the get-go. And I tell my people today, like when there are big things on the line, everyone that works for us, I consider us a team. Obviously we're athletes at the core and we anchor on all of our athletic experiences and we understand the value of teamwork. 
And so I tell everyone that is part of our team, no matter which entity they're involved with, that if it's big and we're gonna make a mistake, let me make it. Like, I want everyone to own their role and do what they need to do to be the best they can be. They know my expectations, they know Bobby's expectations, they know we have someone high profile on the line, but if you're unsure, you know, let me make the mistake. I don't want them to make the mistake that ends up losing the biggest client. And I say that as much for myself as I do for them, to remind myself that like, you know, at the end of the day, it's me that's driving this company. And I cannot put any, I don't wanna to put too much responsibility for on our team. I mean, they, everyone is fantastic, so I have no doubts in their capabilities, but I also wanna be fair to them about what we expect. And so, again, looking back on that one where we lost that client, that I feel like that was on me because I put the responsibility on someone who shouldn't have you know, had that, and that wasn't fair. As we're coming to an end, you, based on your career, based on your a athletic background, you're well-educated, you have a master's degree. What is the one thing that you had to learn that you wish they would have taught you in school? Ooh. Gosh, that's a tough question. I feel like I learned so much getting my MBA. <laughs> um, I think Probably I should have learned earlier on, this is gonna sound bizarre I think, but I should have learned earlier on uh, better interpersonal skills. And the reason I'll say that is that I, I go, we run hard, right? We work hard, we've got a lot of irons in the fire. We, you know, I joke with, with people and say, I'm like the plate spinner in the circus. Right when you're an entrepreneur, yep. you, you've got all the plates spinning and you're going as fast as you can, as well as you can to keep the plates spinning. Um, and I have had to learn kind of the hard way to take my time with people that matter to me. And so it would not, it would not like if you called me, I would get right to the point. Like, hey, what's up? What do you need? You know, and that's not okay. Um, the people that work hard on our team deserve better than that. And so I've had to learn that the hard way. I think I've probably over the years hurt feelings <laughs> and I don't want that. You know, I want everyone to feel appreciated and be inspired and believe in themselves the way that I believe in myself and all of them. Um, and I need to make, I've had to learn to take my time with those people that really matter to us. Excellent. So, well, thank you very much for coming in today, Kristen. We loved hearing about uh, Breaking Limits and the Bobby Labonte Foundation. And uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. This has been great. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash nexageeducation or visit casmoreward.com to catch up on previous episodes. And be sure to be on the lookout for our next episode featuring John Davis and Dave Martinson. John and Dave are business acquaintances who worked side by side at Portrait Innovations in Charlotte, North Carolina.